We are starting a new unit right before our midterms next week, and that is to make our first vector design using actual vector programs. So we're going to go to unit 9. And unit 9 has a few components. It has a question of the day, which is actually due. It would be a good idea for you guys to start it by tonight. You could turn it in after tonight. But it's to help understand the differences between vectors and raster. Right? Why, why learn the skills to make a vector? Well, it's largely because they're cleaner, they're more versatile, they're extremely helpful for things that are a simple color palette and have clean edges. And it's how we can create those things in the culture better. A vector design will always give you a better silkscreen t-shirt than a high-res raster file. Just always. So here I have an example. If you have vector art, it will produce super clean edges, especially of curves, no matter the size, right? So you see the basketball net here. This is just zooming in on this sports logo. And it's, even if it's high resolution at full print resolution, you're going to start to see things degrade as they get to smaller dimensions, like the, the lines around the netting of the hoop. And then, of course, at lower resolutions, the raster is just going to get more and more broken up, whereas a vector from one file can be outputted at any resolution and be as clean as it's allowed to be on whatever the device is, the screen, the print, whatever. So go ahead, if you haven't already, put those some of your thoughts in on that. You can get full credit by writing over 100 words. And if you don't finish it by 11.59 tonight, you can still add to it. Right? The next thing we're doing, you can also see what other people say. Oh, and then I should point out, sorry, in that question of the day, there is a link to slides. I have a couple links to these slides in this unit, right? And the first video explains the difference between the two. We looked at this in the very beginning of the class. This was by one of my, I think it was my very first um, class of digital honor students. And this was a student who just likes vectors more than raster imaging. But they used an old term in their presentation for raster, which was bitmap. So. It's a little confusing, but it will make sense. Bitmaps versus vector graphs. Bitmaps are a collection or an array of bits, which are also known as pixels. A pixel analysis is likely the only kind of graph you have for this. However, there is another. Uh, vector graphics are paths which are plotted through mathematical algorithms. The method of using these algorithms was spearheaded by a man named Pierre Bessier. Pierre was a French engineer way of using the Castel-Jews algorithms to plot any curve in between, and those curves could in turn be used for any number of industrial applications. He was a leading influence on how CAD and CAM machines work, and how 3D models are created, and it's all decided. Because vectors are processed in this way, they don't store finite number of pixels, and can be scaled to an infinite size with no pixelation. This means they can be used for some So that is the whole story, basically. It's the way vectors are coded because they plot points and then either a curve or a straight between the points. They can be scaled to an infinite size from the same file without any degradation. Another term for that is pixelation, where when things reveal their, their limits. Something as small as a stamp, a package, like a bottle, to a poster, all the way up to a planet sized billboard, which can be well from the same file. So what is All right. So they are good for different things. And this is towards the end of the the three minute or so video, but he just plots, you know, what vectors are good for and what raster images are good for. So what are vectors good for? Clean, simple shapes with limited color for files that you need to be scalable. And logos are top of the list for that. So let's look at some different types of logos. The type we're designing for this project, either for your own purposes or following the theme I suggest, which is a Day of the Dead theme, is what's called a pictorial logo or sometimes called an iconic logo. Right? 
these are the icons of brands. So when you have an image that represents the identity of a brand, that is a pictorial logo. Whether it's the old Twitter, the Obama campaign, Starbucks, Batman, Rolling Stones, they just do it with, a, with an image. Logo types like Coca-Cola, which has never had an iconic or pictorial logo, has always been a logo type. A logo type depends primarily on text. The text might have a little bit extra going on, like Walmart has that star, but that star alone does not tell you that you're looking at Walmart, right? NASA, Subway, IBM, USA, Google, all of these have only ever been logo types. We are not designing logo types for this project. And you're encouraged not to incorporate text into your logo design for this project because we'll be designing text in a later assignment. The text has its own concerns. And then there are combined marks, ones that use the two together. Burger King is one of these. And I don't like Burger King's design because even though it's supposed to look like a hamburger, it doesn't look like a hamburger to me. I don't find the colors appetizing. But even in black and white, it doesn't excite me. It is trying to be a little exciting, but it's not dynamic enough to be dynamic, and it's not central symmetrical enough to be central symmetrical, and they really prize their registered trademark too much. Anyway, what's the biggest problem with Burger King is you can't separate, it, separate out the picture from the words. So that takes away versatility, right? Versus NBC, you can use either NBC or the Peacock, or you can use them both. Adidas, you can use either their Adidas thing or, or the logo type, or you can use them together. Same thing with Target, same thing with Nike, same thing with Chanel. Starbucks has just gotten rid of its logo type over time because it's preferable to not need both, right? It's preferable to just have an iconic logo or a logo type, or in these cases, to be able to rely on either. Just gives you more versatility. And the way brands build that over time for marketing purposes is that they show them together enough that then you can start separating them out. And Nike started doing that in the 90s, like only having ad campaigns with the swoosh or only having ad campaigns or, or products with just the, the logo type. But until like the late 80s, the 90s, they were always, always put together. So everyone started to learn, learn the, uh, the language. So a good logo, because they're not always good. Like Starbucks started on a ship, a cruise line, and this was their first logo. Kind of kind of muddy. Doesn't scale well, right? As soon as you make that smaller, you lose all definition. And even there, even though it's this split-tailed, like Celtic goddess of protection at sea, not a mermaid like a lot of people think, it looks a little weird. A little hard to tell what you're looking at, right? So... When they incorporated and kind of spread nationwide, they used this logo, which is a lot clearer. It's, it still uses the porthole design and the split-tailed design, but it simplifies everything. It makes it more central and symmetrical, right? And now that everyone knows that this is Starbucks, this weird split-tailed goddess, they are the, the leading creators of goddess worship symbols in the, in the world now because they just use that brand and we know what it means. All right, so what we're going for is clear, even though it's really hard to understand what that has to do with coffee, unless you know the whole history of the logo. But a good logo is clear, it is engaging, and in most of all, it is ver versatile. And a whole logo design process has to do with researching and sketching and doing lots of versions and then getting a lot of input and then doing lots of revisions and then eventually delivering the final product and helping support it so that that logo is not only used by a client, but is used correctly for the different purposes, right? What file type to use when making it embroidered onto a jacket, that kind of thing. So there's a lot to understand about logo design, even though they appear very simple. To kind of get introduced to it, since you're going to be building your own, is there are three basic approaches that you should know. The central symmetrical approach, which is used by Target, by Shell, by NBC, by CBS, by the Obama campaign, by BP Oil, and lots and lots of others. It is based on horizontals and verticals, usually perfect circles or perfect squares. 
It is always balanced from the center out. And it's made for stability so that the logo has the most pictorial impact possible by kind of creating space around it, by not leading your eye to anything else. So target is kind of the most essential of these, right? Your eye goes in, your eye goes out. Same thing with BP. Your eye goes in, your eye goes out. Dynamic, this is meant for moving the eye across the image and for changing speed while it does it. So it's going to avoid horizontals and verticals. Whether it's Twitter, whether it's Nike, whether it's the Rio de Janeiro Olympics, whether it's the Rolling Stones, this creates excitement and movement You know, in the image. It should still be clear, it should still be engaging, it should still be versatile. And then the play with positive and negative space, like we see with the USA logo type here, or here is a, uh, a German zoo, which is clever. This key is really nice because the key is really strong, but then you, as a second read, get that the, the tines on the, the key make a, a city skyline. The World Wildlife Federation, you just need both the white and the black shapes to fully understand the image. This relationship, this heart cut into this, these two, uh, two silhouettes with white. So again, this is made to give you a little bit more than just one shape. It's a way of getting two kind of images at once, playing with the positive and the negative space. It can, it can hurt clarity a little bit, but it makes up for it with engagement if the, the intended viewer can recognize it. Right. So the whole point is for you to stretch an idea in these multiple ways. So this is just one for our campus mascot for Nico. And uh, here's a central symmetrical approach for Nico the Nighthawk. Here's a dynamic approach. And then here's a play with positive and negative space using a knight and cutting it out of the hawk's head. Once you choose the way you're going to go, then you're going to refine it and decide how is it going to get turned into black shapes. So this is a prep a pretty complicated logo design, but it's still, because it's solidified into black shapes, can read at small scale and large scale. This is about as complicated as you would ever want a logo to get. Better to just make it as simple as possible, right? So, if we want something that's clear, engaging, and versatile, where do we start? You're going to sketch for it in question, in a proving ground number two. You're going to find your best sketch, then we're going to make a black logo and then a color version of that logo. So let's go right to the proving ground. And I give you another link to those slides. Because whatever idea you have, you need to draw in these three ways. Symmetrical, dynamic, or a play of positive and negative space. So this was an idea because my son wanted a forking bull shirt because he liked that pun. So I made a logo for the Forking Bull Barbecue Place, which doesn't really exist. But it's a combination of a, of a bull and a fork, right? So this is uh, my first pass at it, very inspired by the Chicago Bulls logo, very central symmetrical, even if it's not perfect symmetry. And then you have dynamic. This one, I got a lot of movement. And then this one, a play of positive and negative space, getting more kind of indigenous American, kind of Arizona indigenous designs with the bull and then the fork in the positive space. So you're going to post your solutions. Oh, I'm in the wrong class. To Proving Ground 2, your sketches. They can be digitally drawn, traditionally drawn. They should be thumbnails, though. And thumbnail drawings are small preparatory sketches. Do not fill a page. Do not make them too detailed. In fact, I like to sketch my logos pretty small. I'll pass them around for the semester. Because that forces you to simplify. You can also go under assignments to proving ground two, just to get right there. All right, so what is our theme for this semester? It is Day of the Dead. You can do Day of the Dead anything, but I'm going to do Day of the, the Dead Nico the Nighthawk. So that's my idea. I sketch, I start with a crosshairs, and I balance out from the middle, and I come up with a central symmetrical design. And remember, these need to be black shapes. So even if you just sketch with outlines, 